And good morning. Amen. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Great. Praise God. I don't know if I need to remind you, but we're going to keep on celebrating what happened last Sunday. We have 57 people decide to get water baptized last Sunday. And I trust and believe that the Lord is going to do a mighty work in all of those people, continuing to transform and change them from the inside out until their life is completely made new. I'm so just, I'm so blown away by what God has done and what he continues to do in a little church in Seymour, Missouri. So I just want to praise God for that. Today, um, I didn't know I was going to do this until really last night, um, was just praying to the Lord, like, what should I do? Should I start a series? Should I just, you know, kind of freestyle it for a little bit? And that's where I was kind of leaning. I'm just going to get up here and wing some things and see how things go. But I don't know if you've heard, in the last 10 days, this is crazy, y'all, in the last 10 days, we've had like four catastrophe-driven water issues inside of this building, all unrelated. I'm talking flooding entire portions of the church. I'm sorry, parents in here, if y'all had to go to the nursery, that was totally just unfamiliar to you. It's because yesterday we had an ice machine start just malfunctioning, and it flooded that nursery upstairs, and it flooded the nursery directly underneath it. It just ruined everything. And um, that happened yesterday, and I'm just like, Lord, like, what, what am I going to do with that? And I was just like, man, I bet some old timers would tell me something like this, like, you know, the devil, he's just messing with your water because he wants to quench your fire, Jonathan. And I'm just like, I I don't know if that's true, but I'm going to go with it today. I don't know if that's real, but I'm going to go with it today. The devil ain't going to mess with our fire here. But today, I want to start a series called Ships. Ships. If you're watching online, that is like a nautical vessel if you're confused with what I'm saying. Ships. And the subtitle is to How to Overcome hardships. Anybody want to learn how to overcome hardships? Yeah, yeah. uh, It'd be great, right? (laughs) It'd be fantastic. And I believe that the Word of God, I believe Jesus has shown us how to overcome hardships in our life. And, you know, life is an ocean. It's the metaphor that we always get back to, especially in the Gospels. Life is an ocean. Life is a storm. And, um, but we can overcome with the power of Jesus. And thinking through this theme that we're going to be in for the next few weeks, ships, ships, ships. I'm a very image-driven person. I'm visual. And when I think of ships, I think of the great Titanic. Anybody think of the Titanic when you hear the word ship, Titanic? Maybe I'm just dark and twisted because it sank. Like, spoiler alert, it sank like 100 years ago. If you didn't know, now you know the Titanic is down at the bottom of the ocean. But I, like I said, I'm, I'm image-driven. I'm visual. I love movies. I watched two movies in the theater on this Friday. And my wife's like, two movies? And some of my friends are like, you were going hard on movies. I'm like, dude, I could be here all day. I love a good story on the silver screen. But when I think of the Titanic, I don't think of the actual boat. I think of James Cameron's depiction of the Titanic that came out like around the year 1999 or 2000, something like that. One of the biggest movies ever. Yeah, some fans of the Titanic in here. Well, you know what? I got a problem with James Cameron. Can I be real right now? James Cameron, the director, producer, creator of this. I got a problem with James Cameron when it comes to this movie. I got a bone to pick. He wrote this fictional story about a girl named Rose. And Rose, I'm just going to keep the cliff notes here. Rose comes into contact and comes into some sort of ownership of a very expensive prized possession, a piece of jewelry, a necklace called the Heart of the Ocean. For some reason when I was thinking through this, I thought it was called the Hope, Hope Diamond. I don't know why. I almost was going to say that right there. But, but it's the heart of the ocean. It, it was a blue heart, blue diamond heart that would probably be worth a quarter of a billion dollars in today's standards. And I got a problem with James Cameron because Rose, she gets this thing. I ain't going to put her on blast how she got this necklace. She got the necklace. And we have this whole story, her and, her and Jack, you know, Titanic starts going down, her and Jack are on the door, and there was enough room for Jack, for goodness sakes. Leonardo DiCaprio, like, uh, uh, one of my favorite actors of all time, but I digress. There was enough room for Jack on there, and then their story goes on, Jack dies, there's going to be a lot of spoiler alerts, you've had 23 years to watch this movie, there's going to be a lot of those. Jack dies, Rose lives on, and, they're re- and she is basically filming a documentary with, uh, with some filmmakers talking about 
the Titanic, and they take Rose down, and then she gets to see the wreckage and all this. But at the end of the movie, Rose, when she's standing on, on, the, on the deck of this, of this ship, she pulls out the heart of the ocean that everybody thought was lost into the deep depths of the sea. She pulls it out, and... You know, I'm just like, ooh, she's about to show this thing off. Like, I still got it, you know, in scene roll credits. Like, Rose has the prized possession. And then super beautiful, cute, 85-year-old Rose standing on the edge of the deck of the ship. She takes it and goes, oh, <laughs> on purpose, tosses it into the ocean. And I imagine James Cameron just like, wanted this good moment of, like, I don't need this wealth. I don't, I don't need this material thing to give me my worth, to give me my value. I'm like, amen, hallelujah. That's a pretty Judeo-Christian belief right there. But me kind of in my flesh, I was like, Rose, what are you doing, dummy? A quarter of a billion dollars you just tossed down at the bottom of the ocean. What are you doing? You know, the song became popular from the Disney movie Frozen a while back. You know, let it go, let it go. That goes over great every time. I appreciate it. I did not rehearse that. If I would have, it would have been worse probably. But it's just like, I want to tell you all today, this is the title of my message. Don't let it go. If I could, if Rose was real and I could actually talk to that woman, like don't let it go. Don't let it go. And today I want to dig around and poke around at this problem that we have, this struggle that we have. Why do we struggle? letting go of things that we shouldn't? Why do, why do we struggle letting go of the things that we actually value tremendously? And I, I want to I camp around this tension that I'm getting ready to create in your souls today, and I'm going to stick with it. I don't care if you mean mug me the whole sermon. This is going to help you, I promise you, in the name of Jesus. Why do you let go of stuff that you should not let go of? Look, sin, recklessness, you know, division, all of these things, y'all need to let it go. Like, we'll let the frozen chicks sing that song until the cows come home. You need to let that go. But there's things in your life that you continue to let go of that you're not made to let go of. You're letting go of things in your life that every time you let go, your life all of a sudden is in shambles because you let go of something that was so precious to you. Why do we struggle with letting the wrong things go? Or maybe I should say it this way. Why do we struggle with letting the right things that were made for you go? It's like, why, why do we struggle? I, I imagine in 2008, anybody ever heard of Bitcoin? It's just like, you probably, even if you don't know what it is, you've heard of Bitcoin. I would have hate to have been a guy in 2009 buying Bitcoin for a cent a coin and letting it all go. There's stories of it. <laughs> and there's dark stories of people owning thousands and thousands of Bitcoin in 2009 and just going, ah, and I'll buy a pizza with it. I buy pizza with 10,000 bitcoins. I, I would struggle if I let that go because today, or not today, but at its peak a few years ago, bitcoin skyrocketed 650 million percent in value. I, I, would, I, I, I would not feel great about letting that go. The people that did not let that go, their lives are completely different. I imagine you feel the same way if, if you let that go. But maybe in your world, because I don't know if any of us were potential Bitcoin billionaires in the place. I for sure wasn't. Um, and I don't know if anybody was in here. And if I see any tears right now, you can just come to the altars. We'll lay hands on you. God will restore what the enemy has taken from you. We believe in miracles here. Come on. Anybody in the place today? I'm going to ask for participation today, okay? In the middle of tension, I want you to participate, okay? I want you to participate today, even when you're uncomfortable. But some of you have dreams that you let go of. Some maybe you should have. Some might have been God dreams that you just let go of. Some of you have careers that you just let go, ha go of that you should not have let go of. Some of you had jobs. Some of you had these aspirations that you just keep letting go of. Some of you have had a call into ministry and you just let it go because you didn't know how it was going to work out. You didn't know if you could handle it. You didn't know maybe if this is actually a God dream. You just 
left your ministry right where you found it. Some of you have let go relationships, and we know there's relationships that need to have a funeral. You know what I mean? Some of our relationships just need to die, but some of you let go of relationships that you were not supposed to let go of. You quit too early. It's just facts. Some of you, you just wrote people off because they didn't give you what you wanted selfishly, and you just, you, you just let them go, and, you're, and you wrote them off. Some of us, if not all of us, at one point in our Christian walk, if you're a believer here this morning, have let go of your relationship with God at some point. Just let it go. At one point in your life, it was everything to you. Maybe like some of our youth last week, you got saved at an altar, you got baptized, you got filled with the Holy Ghost, but somewhere down the road in the journey of life, something became too big, something became too strong for you to handle, so you let God go. You let God go. And I hope all of us would agree today, you should never let God go. You should never let God go. But if we were all honest, there's points in a lot of our lives, if not all of us, where we are making decisions of just letting God go, even if it's in a moment. I'll compromise here. I'll let my belief go here. I'll let my relationship with God go here. When hardships occur, as we're talking about overcoming hardships, that's where we're going to be at. When hardships occur, we are more apt to jump ship and let go of everything that matters most. When we get emotional because we're in the middle of a storm, all rationality and logic leaves our brain. If you look back on your life, you can see it 100%. You know, everything just, it felt like the sky was falling, and everything that I held dearest, I start to just let go of. And sometimes we don't know that we're actually consciously making this decision. Sometimes we're looking in the rearview mirror after the dust settles, and how did I lose everything? How did I lose everything? It's because everything that you owned, you decided not to anymore. You let go. Just like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they had dominion over everything, and look where we're at now, because they let it go. Don't let it go. Don't let it go. If you were in a better mood this morning, I'd say, look at your neighbor and say, don't let it go. Don't let it go. Don't let what God has given you go, and especially don't let your relationship with God go. This morning, I'm going to give you a a buffet of not delicious, delectable McNuggets. You know, some preachers like to get up here and we like to drop nuggets. We like to drop nuggets of truth. And I tell you, there's, there's, there, I love chicken nuggets, and I'd love to give you that right now. But, you know, a, there's not a lot of wisdom in fast food. I'm probably going to give you a lot of broccoli today. And, you know, we don't like the taste of broccoli initially, but it's probably the wise choice, yeah? Broccoli, you know, chicken, just cleaner stuff. Stuff that takes a little bit to prepare. Today I'm going to be in the book of Ecclesiastes. If you know where that book is, you can turn there. If you don't know where that book is, don't even try right now, okay? I ain't got all the time in the world for you to find Ecclesiastes and get, and get confused with Ephesians and all that. But we're going to have it on the screen. Um, so if you don't want to get confused, you can look at the screen. But we're going to be in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And the book of Ecclesiastes is what theologians and scholars call wisdom literature. Everybody say wisdom literature. Don't you just feel smart saying that stuff? This is like normal words, but wisdom literature. Solomon, the son of David, King Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, and he has been coined the wisest man to ever live. Anybody ever heard that? Solomon, the wisest man to ever live. Have you also heard the phrase, practice what you preach? That's wise, right? The wisest man who ever lived did not practice what he preached. If you look at his life, it's crazy. But nonetheless, the Holy Spirit moved on his heart, and he became the man who said some of the wisest stuff that has ever been said. And we got this book called Ecclesiastes with a bunch of wisdom literature. So we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. Starting in verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. 
If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. Anybody thankful for some friends? But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Say alone. Alone. You see, just even saying that piece of English language felt sad, didn't it? Alone. Pity the person that feels alone. Verse 12, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And that last sentence in verse 12 is what we're going to work around today. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken broken. I was talking to a brother this morning, and just the use of the number three, not just in the Bible, but in creation, is crazy. It's crazy. We're tripartite beings. We got a mind, body, and soul. God, we believe via Scripture, the narrative of Scripture, is a trinity. He is one God in three persons. And you look all throughout nature in biology, in physics, in all of the science, sciences that you can name, you see this pattern of three. There's a beautiful pattern of three. And there's something about this pattern that when we are feeling disconnected and we are feeling alone, we're missing something. We're missing something that's not adding up to a three-stranded cord. A three-stranded cord is not quickly broken. It's not quickly broken. That's wisdom. And, I, and, I, and I'm going to be very honest. Sometimes wisdom sounds silly. Yeah? The Bible says something like that. Sometimes wisdom just sounds foolish to the world. And it can sound foolish to us until we let it get down deep into the core of ourselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken, a.k.a. a cord of three strands is way stronger than a cord of two strands. A cord of three strands is way stronger than a cord by itself. A cord of three strands is wisdom, and that's what I want to get into today. It's wisdom, it's wisdom, it's wisdom, it's wisdom. You know, like, I don't know if anybody struggles with this. I struggle with this deeply, and it's just coming to my attention, just doing self-therapy on myself. Like, why do I have so much anxiety when I go to a city like Dallas-Fort Worth, or when I go to a city like Indianapolis, Indiana, these are some cities I've been to in the last year. And why, why do I get so much anxiety? Does anybody in the room get anxiety when you go somewhere that you don't know by yourself? Does anybody feel that way? It's just like you show up and it's just like you, you feel like you're all alone. It's not wise for me to go to a city by myself. And I can name you off a bunch of funny reasons. Jake was with me in Dallas, Fort, Fort Worth, and he got to see a whole different side of Pastor Jonathan. It was just, I'm just, you know, like I wasn't alone there, but I was the boss there. I had two other guys with me and I was the boss. I cannot manage myself in a new city. I can't manage y'all either. It's just not going to happen. I, 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 think, I think the Lord is leading me to every time I go, and this is a ministry, an open ministry position, okay, that I'm going to offer you right now. You can travel with me and be my chauffeur, 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 <laughs> blow the chauffeur, Pastor Mark, <laughs> chauffeur. You can be my driver and you can be my assistant. Does anybody want to sign up? When I go to a new city, that's the only way that I'm going to go. It's not wise for me to go by myself. It is not wise for Jonathan James Barlow to show up at any city by himself because what he will do is likely lock himself in his hotel room and not show his face. I went to a conference a while back and I skipped three services because I was scared to go out into the real world because I was by myself. And I know I'm telling on myself, some of y'all are judging me right now. Look, I can judge you all day long, okay? I ain't going to do it, though. Give me some grace. It's not wise for me to go by myself. And I love it in verse 9. Look at the Bible in verse 9 if you have it on your lap. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Two are better than one. I'm here to tell you today, United States of America, independence ain't all it's cracked up to be. And hey, I'm independent, you know what I'm saying. I, 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 I'm not on this socialist wave at all. Like I'm for national independence, but your personal independence isn't all, it's all it's cracked up to be. Y'all get in trouble when you're the boss. And you get more than in trouble when you're the boss, you get alone. 
And I know the thoughts in my head on my worst days. And I know the thoughts in my head on my best days. When I'm alone with me and me alone, it can get dark really fast. And I don't know if you can empathize with that. When you feel alone, you are at your worst. When you feel alone, you all of a sudden start to feel your brokenness. Even if you've been healed from it. You've, you've seen a miracle at an altar of prayer. You've seen God move in your life, but when you get alone, you start questioning the miracle. Did, did that even happen? Is that even real? Or is it like placebo effect? What's going on here? When you get alone, you are your worst enemy. When you get alone. When you get alone. And Ecclesiastes says it's two are better than one. There's power in numbers. Independence isn't all it's cracked up to be. Kids want to be adults so bad, y'all. They want their independence so bad. I know because I was a kid. They want their independence so bad. They want to be adults until bills happen. You know what I'm saying? When bills started happening to me, I'm just like, man, like, God, like, you know, if I promise to serve you my whole life, can I just go back to high school and just relive that over and over? Can I go back to mom and dad's house over and over? Like, I need to go back to high school because they're not going to let a 30-year-old live in the base. I, they're not going to let that happen. Some of y'all's moms do, and like, God bless them, uh, but it's just like, mine ain't going to let that happen. Like, God, can I just go back? Like, kids, wanna, we want to grow up so quickly. It's like, we want to leave the house. We want to leave and go off an adventure. Us adults, we want to leave situations that we're in because they're uncomfortable until we feel alone. I I, I want to tell you today, the uncomfortableness that you feel when you're with a group of people is way better than the uncomfortableness you're going to feel when you're alone. But the enemy wants you to separate from your group, from your community, from, from the people that have decided to live life together. He wants to cut you off from that. That's what wolves do. Wolves will cut off a goat or a sheep from the herd, get them all alone, and devour their life. The enemy is a wolf in sheep's clothing. That's Bible, right? Are we good? Are we tracking? I need some community today. I need some fellowship today. I need some, you know what I'm saying? The enemy is a wolf in sheep's clothing. He says, come on, you, you don't need to be there you don't need to be with that group of people. You don't need to be in, in that life group. You don't need to be in that, that Sunday school class. You don't need to be here. You don't need to be there. You just need to go off and be alone because you and God, you're fine. You and God, get alone with God and you'll be fine. And you'll be fine. And I kind of want to poke at that for a second because like, amen, God is all I need, amen. God is all I need to be saved. God is all I need for salvation. But I'm telling you, if you want to live a life that is overcoming hardships and all you got is God, you're going to have trouble. Now hear me. This might hurt some of y'all theology. Y'all might be trying to walk and leave right now. But I'm going to tell you this. I come up here every Sunday, most Sundays, and I come up here and try to give you wisdom. I try to give you knowledge. I try to learn. I try to apply it in my life and then present it to you. And some of you look at me like I got three heads or something. Some of you will never accept what I'm telling you. But I tell you what, if Billy Graham walked in the room today, which, you know, he wouldn't leave glory. He's in glory right now. But if Billy Graham walked in the room today and said the same thing that I'm saying, you'd be like, praise God, Billy. Praise God, Billy. I trust you, Billy. I don't trust that Jonathan guy. I said the same thing. I stole it from Billy. I said the same thing, but you can't accept it from me, but you accept it from him. And I say that because sometimes if you're alone with God so much, You stop to trust his voice, and somebody else can walk in and say the same thing, and you accept it. Now, that's not a bad thing. I believe God has created fellowship this way. He wants a relationship with you, but he wants a deeper level of fellowship with you and everybody else around you. Because sometimes we are boneheaded, knuckleheaded humans, and we ain't listening to the voice of our Father, but our Father is everywhere, and he can influence everything, and our Father is so big, he can talk to your best friend and say, hey, say this to Susie. She needs to hear this. She ain't hearing it from me, but if she hears it from you, she will accept it. And that's what fellowship is. So the wolf in sheep's clothing tries to cut off your fellowship with the brethren, with with your brothers and sisters, so you stop actually hearing 
the voice of God. One is better than, or two is better than one, right? I like to do things backward. I was going to throw you off for a second, but I don't want to confuse anybody. Two is better than one. When, you, when you're in your sin, when you're fallen in your addiction, you want to be alone. You want to you wanna whittle it all down to one. I don't want nobody to know my junk. I just want to whittle it all down to one. I want to cut God out of the whole situation. I want to stay down. This is the biggest thing I've learned just with traveling through life with people who have deep struggles is when they have deep struggles every once in a while, that struggle will pop up. It will knock them down and they'll stay down way too long. Here's what it looks like. I fall, I get in trouble, I don't reach out to anybody, they reach out to me, I block them, I don't answer them, I disconnect myself and I make myself alone because for some reason somebody has tricked me to believe if I just isolate myself, I can get fixed easier. I'm telling you, isolation will not help you overcome your hardship, community, and fellowship will. God has set it up that way. Yes, God can do whatever He wants to do, amen. And He can choose to give you a miracle however He wants to do it. He can do it in a prison cell. He can do it when you're isolated, but He wants and prefers to do it with everybody else because that's how miracles spread. That's how belief happens. That's how faith rises. You need to accept help. You need to make it a goal to get up faster. Accept help. Why do we struggle with accepting help so much? Why? Why do I struggle with accepting help when I know it's the thing that I actually need? It's like I I, I remember in school seeing kids get bullied by somebody. And... It's just like, that's heavy. It's just like, what are they going to do? That dude, that kid's a foot taller, man. He hit puberty already. Like, this is like, this is, what are they going to do? And then a friend steps in and says, hey, knock it off, dude. Knock it off, man. And it's just like, you see a glimpse of just strength. And the kid that was getting bullied all of a sudden has strength that came from the outside of him because somebody else who was a friend stepped in to fellowship in a moment of need, in a moment of trial. Some of you might have experienced your boss, somebody who hired you, somebody that is in charge of you, harassing you. Anybody ever just had a bad boss? And it's just like, you know, they're just harassing you and they're just driving you down in the ground. And then a coworker steps in with no authority over this boss says, hey, cut it out. This is not right. All of a sudden, strength just rises. Hope just rises in a situation. I love this out of Leviticus 26. We're going way back in Leviticus. This is where y'all stop your yearly Bible reading plans, by the way, in Leviticus. I know it. I'm going to judge y'all. I'm going to open up your Bible app and see where you stopped in January. It was Leviticus 100%. That's where I stopped. Uh, Five of you, but anyways, first (laughs) chapter 26, verse 8. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to fight. Your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. I love the imagery of that, but what I get, the point and principle that I'm taking out of that is there's a compound effect that happens when you show up with another brother or sister. And there's a compound effect that happens when you show up with a brother or sister and the Lord is there. There's something mystical, there's something magical, there's something miraculous that happens when you show up in community with a friend, a family member, or a loved one, and the Lord is in your midst. There's something crazy that happens, and some of you today just showed up to church only for God. And that sounds good when it hits your ears. I'm coming only for you, God. God gets all the glory, amen. God gets all the worship, amen. I'm only coming for you, God. All the other people, they're just there with me doing this God vertical thing. There's no horizontal love. There's no horizontal support. We're just here to come and worship God only. And some of you just came just to hang out with people. Some of you just came because this is your social club. This is the modern day social club. Some of you just came for the people that you're here with and you didn't come to connect with God at all. What if we started showing up for both today? What if we came because we love God and we glorify God and we worship Him, but we come to a corporate place of worship because we need each other? You need me. I need you. We all need each other in fellowship. What if we started showing up to things like this? I imagine imagine things in your life would start coming together a little bit, and you'd stop wanting to let things go. 
things would start coming together. If you don't know me, I absolutely love music. I, I love music. I'm a music nerd. And uh, I, I've been listening to um, the soundtrack to the Oppenheimer movie um, that Ludwig Göransson, I had to write his name down because I don't speak German like that. Ludwig Göransson, he's, he's a composer. He's a producer. He puts together symphonies. And it's just an insane work of art. And what I love about music is you can get somebody up here with a violin and they're just playing a melody. And you're like, that's sweet. Like, that's so cool. I wish I could do that. And then somebody else steps on stage and starts playing a cello. A slightly different melody, which we call a harmony. The same structure, but different notes. And all of a sudden, the mood shifts. All of a sudden, somebody with a viola steps in, and they start playing something else in a different register, in a different harmony, and all of a sudden, everything just comes together like glue, and you feel a certain way. It started so simple and so clean, and it grows so complex and so emotional, and the depth is just as deep as the ocean, and it's just, that's why I love music. That's why I absolutely love music, and I think God loves music, too. It says, when God created everything, it came in with, with the sons of God and the light, the bright and morning stars singing creation into existence. The angels were literally on cue to sing when God said, let there be light. And I imagine it wasn't just one note. I imagine it was a myriad, a harmony of notes to bring in creation. I really think God loves music. I think, I really think this, I really believe this, that God doesn't just love melody. He doesn't just love, you know, something so clear and concise. He loves harmony. He loves, see, like your story is a melody. The story you're playing out today is a melody. And we're all hoping for the major keys. We're all hoping for the uplifting melodies. But a lot of our stories are in a minor key right now. And it sounds and it feels sad to us. But if, if we allow God, with a relationship with God and relationship with others to become a fellowship together, he can bring in all of our stories together and create a beautiful, a beautiful symphony of harmony, a beautiful piece, a masterpiece that comes together because we're together and he's with us. Matthew chapter 18, uh, I think it's chapter 18, verse 20. I think there's a slide for this. Matthew 18, 20 says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. And I want you to keep that slide up there to, to remember all of us. When we come together, he is in our midst. When all of our broken pieces and broken stories and all of our fragments of pain and trauma come together, the Lord is in our midst creating a beautiful masterpiece, a beautiful work of art, a symphony of wonder working, a symphony of salvation stories all together so the world can look at us and experience something beautiful. I know your life doesn't feel beautiful this morning, but you put your life with your life with your life with your life and your life with your life, all of a sudden it becomes miraculous. And we can see the, the amazing, wonder-working power of the way maker. I love that song, the, let the way maker through today. The way to let the way maker through today is to take your melody and put it with somebody else's harmony so that the world can see that Jesus is here in your midst. Jesus is here in your midst. With this sermon series, and I, and I am wrapping up here, praise God, hallelujah, he's real. I want, I want to create an anchor for every single sermon for you to walk home with. Today's anchor is going to be this. We're going to have it on the slide. Turning your relationships into fellowships gives you power to hold on in a storm. I told you 20 minutes ago, don't let go. Don't let go. Some of you are gripping on so tight. How, how do I not let go in the middle of this storm? You're so relational with your storm. You're so romantic with your storm. It's a relationship for you. You're so relational and romantic with your demons today. Can I talk for a second? They're your best friends, even though you complain about them, even though you, you know, like, oh, I wish he would leave. No, no, you've, you've created a relationship, a bond with things that you ought not to hold on to. You need to let go of those things. You need to grab a hold of 
taking your relationships. I'm talking your relationship with God. I'm talking your relationship with your family. I'm talking relationship with your church. I'm talking relationship with your church people, brethren, the brothers and sisters of Christ. You need to take your relationships this morning and you need to mature them into fellowship. See, relationships can shift quickly into selfishness. Fellowship is selflessness. When I jump and dive into fellowship, I am concerned about my brother. I am concerned about my sister, and I can serve my brother, and I can serve my sister. And if two or three of us in the brotherhood are here, that means Christ is here too, and he is the one that holds us together. Jesus is the one that will hold on to you if you get into fellowship with everybody else. The anchor. Tammy and Terry used to sing a song, The Anchor Holds. The anchor Jesus Christ, Hebrews chapter 6, that's where this imagery is coming from. The anchor holds you together because he is the third strand in your rope. Back to Ecclesiastes, it's very peculiar, peculiar passage. It talks about two are better than one. If anybody falls down, help the other one back up. Pity the one that just is by themselves. If two lie together, keep warm. How can one stay warm alone? The one may be overpowered. Two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands. Three strands. What's the third strand? It's God. Who's the third strand? It's God. You can have a relationship with God by yourself. That's two strands. You can have a relationship with your friends and family by yourself. That's two strands. But if you have a relationship with God and your community, God is saying if you step into fellowship, you can hold on. Because Jesus says, I am the one holding on to you. I am your anchor. I'm your anchor. And you know, Rose, her most prized possession, she threw it off the Titanic. And that's what we do often. We're throwing our most prized possession. Our relationship with God just goes overboard. Our relationship with our spouse goes overboard. Our relationships with our friends and families and church, they go overboard. That's what we do. We are professional let it goers of the things that we should hold on to. That's what we do as humanity. So can you hold on in the middle of the storm? No. You can't do it. You've proven it time and time again. But the anchor holds. The anchor holds in the eye of the storm. The person does not. Jesus has determined himself to hold on to you. He will never let you go. He will never throw you overboard. He will never change his mind about you. He is the anchor holding on to you. He is the third strand in the cord. And this is crazy confirmation. I was talking to a brother this morning about this message. He says, have you heard of the Kern Mantle rope? I say, yeah, I heard about it, but it, it kind of blew my mind. I, I, didn't, I couldn't get it into this because it was just too much. And he kept talking about it, kept talking about it, kept talking about it. It's a rope for rescue. It's a rope for rescue. And it's a three-stranded cord all weaved together with a sheath with a cord in the middle. And if, 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 there's no wo- if it's not wove together, the cord would just snap. And if there was no cord in the middle, the, the, the sheath of other cords weaved around it, it just would not have the strength. This Kermantle rope is a beautiful rescue piece of technology, and I believe it's, I believe it's from the wisdom out of Ecclesiastes. He was telling me that he, he, can, he can get this Kermantle, this three-rope system together, and put somebody on it, and, and all of a sudden they are a third of the weight of they actually are on the rope. And it's three times easier to pull that person out of the mess that they're in. And look, God is the God of impossible. He's the God. I don't, I don't think it's three times easier for Jesus to pull you up. I think the principle today is Jesus can pull you out of anything with no effort today. Jesus can get you up out of that mess that you're in, this mess that you can't let go of. He can get you up out of it. And guess what? He holds on to you. There's no ladder into heaven that you can climb up today. No, Jesus is the anchor, and the anchor, it's not at the bottom of an ocean, the anchor is in heaven. And when you said yes to him, he ties himself to you, and you don't climb to him, you don't pull your rope into him. No, he pulls you into heaven, that's what grace is. And every time you get off track, that, that feeling, that conviction that you get when you sin, that conviction you get when you fall down, and you feel this pulling, you feel this drawing, that is the rope of Jesus pulling you back into the heaven's will, into the Father's will. Jesus is the 
the anchor that holds in the middle of a storm, and he is the rope that is pulling you all the way into the promised land today. So you need to let go of all the junk today. You need to let go of the sin today. You need to let go of the selfishness today. And you need to embrace what the fellowship of the brethren is. As we move forward these next few weeks, this series, it's a, it's, it's a comp- compilation of a lot of different themes and, and principles and virtues that we all need to have. Primarily, it is, a, it is a series on community, why we need each other. And this is really part one to a two-part message that I'm going to finish next week. Um, we're going to stay on the God topic next week because I really want you to realize who God is next week. Because your relationship with God is the most important relationship there is. And if you're missing that, you're going to be missing out. And I want you to understand who God is. But this is, this is going to be a series on just what, what it means to become a disciple. What it means to become a disciple. Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't give the great commission and command you to become a monk. Even when some of us walk into these services, we become a monk. I can't, I can't participate with my brothers and sisters because I am, I'm getting my God thing right now. I'm getting my God stuff right now, so don't bo- I can't be bothered right now. I'm getting a download from God right now. Maybe that download's for somebody. Maybe somebody needs to be encouraged. Maybe this is created for participation with brothers and sisters because we're all living hard lives on the outside, and 167 hours of the week we are alone without each other in this type of setting. So maybe this setting is for fellowship. And yeah, you can worship God in fellowship because He wants you to. You can worship God in your prayer closet, and you should if you've got a prayer closet or a prayer garage or a prayer road. Definitely worship God when you're alone, but when you come together, we need to learn how to worship God in community. We need to learn how to feed off of each other's stories. We need to learn how to serve each other in stories. So that's what this ship's sermon series is going to be about. It's going to be about fellowship, the anchor, turning your relationships into fellowship, taking your relationships off the island and moving it where the people are, moving it where your brothers and sisters are, that gives you the power to hold on in a storm. That is the power of Jesus Christ. You're his prized possession. He will not let you go. You need to realize that and believe it today. And you need to realize when you look at your sisters and you look at your brothers, they are his prized possession too. So, so when we cross ways, when you disagree with me, like a lot of y'all are going to disagree with me for a long time because I'm not leaving unless somebody fires me. Like, this is going to be honest. You're just going to keep disagreeing with me on things. Are you just going to let me go and write me off because I might be wrong in your eyes? Am I going to write you off because you're coming up against me? No, you are God, his prized possession. You are who Jesus died for. And I got to look at you like that. And I do. That's why I come up here. Some of you talk about me. Some of you encourage me. I don't, it doesn't matter what you do to me. I'm doing this because I see the God in you. I see the prized possession of God in you. That's why I'm going to do this until they don't let me do this anymore. We have to come to this place and look at every single soul in the room and say, prized possession. Prized possession. Jesus died for you. He's living for you. Even, even if you're a dirtbag to me, even though I'm a dirtbag to you, we got to fix that. We got to get over it because we're family. That's what fellowship is. That's what fellowship is. I'm not going to let it go. I'm not going to let it go. Writer of Hebrews says, don't forsake the assembling of the brethren like many are doing. Don't let it go. There's power when you come together. There's withstanding hardship power when you come together. So don't let it go. Don't let it go. I just want you to let go of the idea that you can do this alone. 90% of you, when I said, say alone, y'all like, alone. You said alone, and it's sad, but the enemy has tricked you into buying in to loneliness. I want you to let go of loneliness today. I want you to let go of isolation today. What would happen if you did? What would happen today, right here, August 5th? Is that where we're at? Sixth, Y'all adding a day to my life, I'm that much older. What would happen today if August 6th, you let God into your relationships with people? 
What if today you let God into your marriage for the first time? Oh, John, I've been a Christian for 30 years, but yeah, but has God saved your marriage? Has God redeemed your marriage? Have you let him in to your marriage? What would happen today to your marriage? What would happen today to your children? What would happen today for your grandchildren's children's children's children? If today you let God in to your relationship with your spouse or your friends or your relationship with your church, what if you let God actually come and invade your relationships? What if you let people in to your relationship with God? Man, this is so American. I'm Christian on Sunday, and yeah, I'm Christian all the other days of the week, but I ain't gonna talk about it. Isn't, that's none of their business. No, 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 no. Your faith is everybody's business. Your faith is everybody's business. Your faith might be that, that life raft that somebody is looking for and needing so desperately, and they have not been listening to God, but God is trying to talk through you to them. That's your faith. What if you let people into your relationship with God today? You've been praying. You've been praying. You've been praying for that lost friend. You've been praying for that lost fan. Oh, God, I wish they would just come. talk to them. Tell them what you've gone through. Don't give them a rose pear color of glasses. Just tell them what the reality is. Tell them your story. Tell them your salvation. Tell them why you have hope in the middle of the storm in Jesus. Tell them, and maybe, maybe, maybe they can hear the voice of God for the first time in years. That's what fellowship is. It's getting over yourself. It's getting over all of your failures and all of your flaws. It's getting over all of the pain and hurt somebody else put on you, and it's starting to serve everybody else around you. That's fellowship. It's fellowship. So what would happen? What would happen? What would happen? What would happen if this whole entire church just started actually being a fellowship? Ever since I started, the Lord put this on my heart. I'm driving around, you know, just Springfield, and I see the word fellowship on a bunch of churches' names. I'm like, oh, they, I don't know if they get it, but somebody got it at one point that fellowship is important. Fellowship Church of this, Fellowship Church, Fellowship Assembly, all these. Fellowship, fellowship, together, fellow, together. We're in this together. And if you don't feel like anybody's in it with you, you need to let people in. And if you don't feel like God is in it with you, you need to let him in. That's what fellowship is, maturing and upgrading your individual relationships into community, community unity, unifying together. If you could experience true fellowship today, if you could experience today, you would, you would have a newfound strength. You, you would have a new perspective on life. You'd have a brand new outlook. And I believe God has that for every single one of us this morning. And I don't know what yours looks like. I know what mine looks like. But I just know that I know that I know if you let go of the stuff you don't need and let God hold on to the stuff that you do need. Remember, let go and let God. Let go of the junk and let God hold on to you. You will make it through every hardship because it's not by your will. It's not by your might. It's by the might of Jesus Christ who has already beaten death, hell, and the grave on your behalf. So why are we afraid of some waves? Why are we afraid of some storms? Why are we afraid of some participation? Like God isn't smarter than a meteorologist. Why are we afraid of earthly, temporal things when God, via your relationship with him, has already saved your eternal soul? I almost said it like this. Your relationship with God saves your soul eternally. Relationship with others, fellowship, saves your earthly life. All the saved individuals in here, we probably don't agree on a lot of things theologically, but we probably at least agree if you're saved, you're going to heaven. If you want to argue that, I don't know what to do with you. <laughs> if you're saved, you're going to heaven. There's a lot of saved individuals with what appears to be an unsaved life. Oh, they believe in God and he lets them go through that. Look, God will let you go through some things, but you're going through a lot of things that God doesn't want you to go through because you haven't 
You haven't grasped the reality that I have a brother over here, I have a sister over here, I have, I have a, a grandma over here, I have an elder over here that can help me through some stuff if I just let them into my story. So this morning, I want you to consider, I'm going to get taken out by this table. I'm going to fall down, and I'm going to need y'all help me up, okay? If I swear, guys, if I ever fall down, some of you act like I'm going to fall off this stage. I probably will one day, okay? I ain't prophesying, but you know how those things work. Help me up, okay? You going to help me up? Come on, somebody help me up. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of chunky, so it might be, I might need like three guys, you know what I'm saying? Two's better than one, I need like three. Yeah. But I, I envision a fellowship of believers in Seymour, Missouri that doesn't just come to worship God, doesn't just come to hang out, but we come to do all of these things together. So that the world that is not inside of here, when we leave this place, they can hear. And they're hearing. I'm telling you, people are hearing. There's people in different states that I come across, they're like, what is going on in Seymour? It's like, I don't know, dude. It's just God and his people, and he's working, and he's moving. So that's a body of believers, but that can, that can also happen with just your life. You're like, man, what happened to you? Let me tell you. Let me, let me tell you for real. So that's, that's what I think can happen. That's what I imagine by the power of the Holy Spirit when I'm like, God, show me. I see a people that are actually united in one faith, in one mission. To- Dustin, you're dismissed. Hey, thank you so much for joining us today online at SNC. We pray that you were blessed by the worship and encouraged by the message. But more than anything, we pray that you are impacted by the real love of Jesus, because that's why we exist. We're a church in love with Jesus with a heart to see the lost become found. We love you. We're for you. But more than anything, Jesus loves you and he's for you. Please get connected with us. Follow the link in the description to get connected with us so we can talk back and forth and get to know you and your story. Love you. See you next time.